So it's been a while since I did a long intro. I know some of you miss it, but I think most prefer I get straight to the mysteries. But I want to take a minute to talk about this video and this series. As you've seen by the title, this is the final part. We have covered close to 200 separate mysteries that have taken place in the South. It's been a wild and interesting ride. And although it has come to an end, I still have a lot of mysteries I didn't cover. So at some point in the future, I may do a bonus Southern video or something of that nature. But for now, I am comfortable closing the door on this series. I hope you all enjoyed watching it as much as I have creating it. Now, for some housekeeping. I want to thank all the viewers that took their time to subscribe and finally get me over 10,000. I never would have dreamed that anyone would want to listen to this hit from the foothills, so I'm much obliged to you. Also, I want to thank the members who have supported this endeavor. And finally, I want to give a special shout out to the channel, Truth is Stranger Than Fiction. You guys may remember, me and him did a collaboration in what feels like forever ago. He's my go-to cryptid guy. Every time I came up with a blank for a cryptid entry on this southern iceberg, and even the Midwest iceberg, I would just shoot him a message and he would send me some good ideas. Actually, pretty much all of the good cryptid entries in this series were suggested by him. So I want to thank him here, and I would suggest, if you like cryptid stories, please go check out his channel. You won't regret it. With that being said, for the final time, grab those Route 11 sour cream and chive potato chips made in Mount Jackson, Virginia, and that Fitz's Cardinal Cream Soda made in St. Louis, Missouri, and place an order to the Waffle House, then assume the resting position. We're taking I-75 down south one last time to delve into some southern mysteries. November 20th, 1986, 17-year-old Madeline Pons of Ethelsville, Alabama would go into her evening shift at a convenience store across the state line in Columbus, Mississippi. The high school senior was just working for a little bit of extra money until she graduated, where she then planned to join the armed forces. The night began like any other, and about halfway through her shift, around 9.05 p.m., Madeline's mother would drop by to bring her dinner, like she normally did, and then she hung around the store to talk for a few minutes before leaving. She would then make it back home at 9.10 p.m., leaving Madeline to finish out her shift. Her parents had only let her take the job as long as the owner assured them she would not be working alone. However, this ended up not being the case, and Madeline became used to working alone most of the time, to her parents' dismay. However, she convinced them to let her keep the job since she only planned to keep it until she graduated. That may be because the job was very convenient. It was super close to her home, which is why it took her mother less than five minutes to get back. But right around the same time her mom pulled up back home, a customer pulled into the store. This customer would stand near the register for a few minutes, waiting on Madeline to ring up his items, but he became increasingly alarmed when a clerk did not show up, and the confused customer decided he better call the police. A deputy arrived shortly after, and a call was placed to the manager, as well as to Madeline's mother, Mary Ann. Her mother would tell police she could not believe it, because she had just left the store five minutes ago, and Madeline was there. But the terrified parents rushed to the store. Meanwhile, police began to look over the scene and realized there were no signs of a struggle. The manager of the store, however, noted that around 600 bucks was missing from the register. They then began to search around and found Madeline's belongings were still in the store, and her car was still in the parking lot. Inside her car was her purse, wallet, keys, and hairbrush. Obviously, the whole thing greatly worried her family, as Madeline was not one to leave without telling her mother where she was going. It was also unlike her to leave her purse and hairbrush behind. The police agreed and stated she was most likely abducted during a robbery. To be thorough though, detectives did look at the possibility that she had taken the money herself and ran off with someone, but after interviewing multiple people, it just didn't fit her profile so they launched a massive search looking for her. Police on both sides of the state line searched for clues, but found nothing. They interviewed a ton of people around the area, and not one person heard or seen anything odd. A $10,000 reward was posted by her parents, who hoped she may still be alive. In fact, she had mentioned to her father previously, after watching a TV special about abduction, that she 
would put up a fight and would not allow someone to take her, but she was tiny at 105 pounds and would be easily overpowered by someone much larger and would probably just comply if they had a weapon. This disappearance took place in the blink of an eye and has never had resolution. Not one clue about Madeline's whereabouts have ever been found. Heck, even after putting up flyers all over the country, there's only been a few possible sightings. One of these came from someone who claimed that Madeline was living in Anniston, Alabama, some two and a half hours away, and was working at a poultry plant. When detectives followed up the lead, they were stunned to find the woman they believed was Madeline, who was hiding and had changed her name. The woman kept insisting she was not her, however, and it was only after Madeline's uncle was called in by police to meet the woman that they were safely able to rule her out. Although, her uncle did state she could pass for Madeline's twin. They would follow up several other sightings over the next few years, but they all led to nothing, and police went back to their original theory that she was murdered that night. And in a time before security cameras were everywhere and DNA breakthroughs, the case has always needed an eyewitness or someone to have came forward to inform the authorities of what really happened, but that has never occurred. And although there is almost zero in terms of evidence, there's been one rumor surrounding the case that has persisted for decades, and that is, a lone whale that sits behind the store may hold the answers to the mystery, as it's long been theorized that whoever was responsible for her disappearance may have disposed of her in the whale, even though that would be hard to believe considering this all happened within five minutes, meaning the perp would have most likely had to return to the scene of the crime later on, which was just absurd. Regardless, by 2010, the police would finally tackle this long-held gossip. The sheriff, who blamed low funding in the past, had finally been given the funds to drain the well, which was now capped and set below a barbecue pit attached to the store. First, they brought a dog out, who indicated that remains could be in the well, although I do wonder how any scent could be left after nearly a quarter of a century. Police then sent a camera down into the well, and the findings were inconclusive, but they finally hired the company to drain the well. That was 14 years ago, and I could not find any follow-ups, so I'm going to assume that nothing was found in the well, and in nearly four decades since her disappearance, we are no closer to knowing what happened to Madeline. The main theory obviously proposed by police is murder, but did this suspect just intend to go in and rob the place and flee, and changed his mind at the last minute and took Madeline along as a hostage, or did he have other intents in mind? Or was the robbery the secondary motive all along and he was a predator preying on Madeline? Sadly, no one knows. Halloween, 2005. Just southeast of Garden City in the rural part of Blount County, Alabama, hunters would come across a startling find which may have led to their scariest Halloween yet because as they walked along some railroad tracks, they would come across the skeletal remains of an individual. Obviously, the hunters would make a call to authorities who came over to recover the remains and see what else they could find. Little could they know this was going to lead to one of the most confusing unidentified person cases in Alabama history. To start, detectives canvassed the scene and found a 22 revolver with five spent cartridges and one bullet that remained chambered. However, since the remains were so decomposed, Detectives were not sure if the man had died from the gunshots, although it was probably likely. The remains did show evidence of a once fractured collarbone that had healed. In addition, the person seemed to have had some type of lower back condition. He was listed as being 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 8 and between 33 and 45 years old, most likely deceased for a few weeks up to a year, and the individual had numerous dental restorations done. Police then searched the remains in hopes of finding this person's ID and found nothing, but they did catch what they thought was going to be a break, because nearby was a woman's driver's license, so obviously, police must have assumed this will be an easy case. They would go back to the station and begin the process of tracking down the lady that owned the driver's license. They would call her, and sure enough, she stated that the remains must be the man who was her common-law husband. He had just left her a year prior in 2004, and on his way out, he snatched her license. Now, I don't know why he did that, and it's not really elaborated on, but she did confirm 
The man's name was Chad Patrick Singleton, and his birthday was April 1st, 1972. So case closed, right? Well, no. Because you see, when police began looking into the background of Chad, they soon found out he had died in 1995, some 10 years before this person's remains were found near the railroad tracks. And as you may imagine, this opened up the case to a few more questions. If the real Chad was already deceased, then who was this? Secondly, why did this man want to change identities? Was he wanted? Did he even know Chad? Well, detectives would try to get to the bottom of these questions, and they soon found out the imposter Chad's wife. Yeah, she was just as in the dark as the police were. She had no idea the man she had been with, and had even had a common law marriage with, was living under a fake identity. But she did turn over a couple of pictures she had taken of him, which is where we get these from. With such a good photo of the man, one would think the identity would be easily made, and there have been a few guesses. One of the lesser believed ones, to me anyways, is a man named Jason Atkins, who vanished from Huntington, West Virginia on January 18, 1999. He disappeared when his brother's boat capsized on the Ohio River. His brother was rescued, but Jason was never seen again. And while that might seem like an obvious case of drowning, detectives weren't so sure. They actually thought, considering his body was never found, it was possible he faked his death and left to start a new life. But why? Well, he was behind on child support payments. To me, this one is a stretch. But there are a couple more. First was that of David Britt Sargent, who disappeared on May 30th, 1999. He was 18 at the time, which would put him out of the age range when the body was found. But he was the same height range at 5 foot 7. And even crazier, he was only about a 35 minute drive from the area where imposter Chad was found. He also had similar eyebrows, ears, and hairline. According to reports, David had been camping on his mom's property in Blount County, again, where the skeletal remains were found, and he just vanished. His car was found abandoned on a country road later on, but again, the age is a little bit off, so that's why I saved the most likely match for last, that of Herman Matthew Gamble. Just looks wise, he is probably the closest match, but again, there are a few issues. Gamble disappeared at the age of 25 in 2004 and was 5 foot 7, so a few years off the coroner's estimated age, but right within the height range. And he also disappeared in McCullough, Alabama, about a 55 minute drive south of where the remains were found. But here's the issue with this one Gamble vanished on June 16th, 2004, a little bit over a year before the body was found, and just a few months before he allegedly left his common law wife. Which brings up the whole problem with this case, the common law marriage. Laws on this vary across states that allow it. Alabama itself done away with it in 2017, but if you had a common law marriage beforehand, it was still legal. And since this happened in the early 2000s, it's possible they did have a common law marriage. But many people incorrectly think that just living together for 10 years makes a common law marriage. But that's not exactly true, at least in Alabama. It could be a very short time. It just depends on if you bought a home together, had a joint bank account, shared a last name, filed joint taxes, etc, etc. So it's possible this woman wasn't even with him all that long, which has led to the theory that it's possible this man was married to another woman somewhere else, hence why he used the fake name. And it could be why he up and left her. Of course, it doesn't explain why he took her driver's license, but getting back to Herman Gamble, he was last seen working security at a bar, and he simply left the establishment and was never seen again. He left behind all of his belongings, as well as his insulin, and drove off. There was no sign of foul play, but it could be possible he left and something happened to him that night, and he was taken to Blount County, where he was murdered that June. But that doesn't fit the wife's timeline, and it's important to note, he was known at Herman at this job while his wife knew him as Chad. So does this mean we can safely rule him out? Who knows? The mystery gets even more confusing when, as many have pointed out, there is almost zero information that a real Chad Singleton ever lived. This is one of the most convoluted missing person cases I've ever covered, and I hope there is a resolution soon. Are Black Panthers roaming around the foothills of eastern Kentucky? That's what this next cryptid mystery alleges. And let me say beforehand, 
I could have easily put Panther sightings in any of these states in this series, but I wanted to pick Kentucky for a reason we'll get to later. But first, let's dive into the actual animal, that of the more accurately named cougar. The large cat is known by various other names, such as puma, mountain lion, catamount, and in our case, panther. And that's what makes this cryptid so interesting. It's the fact that we know these animals exist. However, the mystery is twofold. First, according to biologists and park rangers, there is no population of these big cats east of the Mississippi River, except for the occasional male cougar who wanders into the area, meaning basically there are supposed to be no panthers in most of the south, except for one state, and that is Florida, which is home to the Florida panther in the southern part of the state, although this animal is endangered and there's not many sightings. Then, we get to the second part of the mystery, the actual black color of this said cat. There are obviously real cases of large cats who, due to a birth defect, result in the animal being of a dark pigment. This has been seen in both jaguars and leopards alike. However, according to biologists, there is not one known specimen of a black cougar or panther. There's never been a real photograph, nor has there been one killed in the wild. And in spite of this, they have been seen all over the Appalachians, especially in eastern Kentucky. Witnesses have described them coming down to their properties near their homes, seeing them out when driving through rural areas, and numerous reports of missing livestock and sometimes pets. They are described as being sleek and slinky in appearance, with a body length of that of a Great Dane, and they are known to let out a screech that sounds like a woman's scream or baby crying. Just browsing over comment sections about Black Panther sightings in Kentucky, you will find numerous people who have sworn to have seen one. However, the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife denies their existence, stating they are not native to the area, nor is the climate suitable for them, citing they are more typically found in South American jungles. They instead propose that what people are really seeing are just misidentifications or exaggerations of larger domesticated stray cats. Once again, citing there are no mountain lions, panthers, or whatever you want to call them, in Kentucky. In fact, in 2014, one cougar was shot and killed by a Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife officer due to public safety concerns, and that cougar was the first officially documented sighting since before the Civil War. And remember that comment section I mentioned? Well, I was able to find an old Kentucky hunting forum where surprisingly, the hunters there were more dismissive of these claims. Citing all their years in the woods, they have never once come across the sign of a big cat, especially a black one. Yet, the animal has become so ingrained into the culture that some communities have legends based around the cryptid, which is why I chose Kentucky. One of these comes from a small town on the Kentucky-Tennessee border known as the Mulberry Black Thing. It's unsure where the story got its start, but in the small community of Mulberry, a large black panther is said to live and hunt in the local mountains. After decades of alleged sightings of the cat, the story over time has gotten turned into more of a supernatural one, with claims of the panther really being a witch which transforms into the cat. And while obviously the vast majority of people in the area don't believe that, many still have claimed to have seen the animal and still see it to this day. And since cougars only live about a decade, it would mean there are multiple black panthers. Which leads us to the broader question, how many sightings of a real documented animal does it take until it's no longer considered a cryptid? Or is it the more likely scenario that people are really just seeing large stray cats? If you have followed both the Southern and Midwest series, then you'll be familiar with this next mystery. It comes from a very weird half a year in the United States between late 1896 to mid-1897, in which numerous sightings of unidentified airships took place. Sometimes, there were just unidentified lights in the night sky, while other times, there were very descriptive reports of airships with human crews on it, or something that looked human, walking around on board. It's kind of like the predecessor to UFOs, except in these stories, it was usually believed that some mad scientist had successfully built the aircraft and had kept it hidden from the public. Now many of these stories were unconvincing, but some were really interesting, and the next one has been labeled as one of the most credible in the country's history. 
but we first have to travel to Washita Mountains near Hot Springs, Arkansas on May 7, 1897, when Constable John J. Sumter Jr. and his deputy, John McLemore, were out investigating claims of cattle rustling, or, in some accounts, serving a subpoena near the community of Jesseville. The two men were riding northwest over the mountains when they saw a bright light in the sky. They continued to watch it slowly as it disappeared behind the mountaintops, so the men continued to ride after it. They would eventually go a few more miles when they again seen the light. This time, it was much closer to earth and was in the process of descending, but it disappeared. So the men raced for another half a mile before their horses were too afraid to go any further or, in some sources, too tired. Not sure what to do, they dismounted and armed themselves. As they started moving forward, they noticed several people in the darkness up ahead, moving around with lights. They slowly approached forward to investigate. The two lawmen would finally come upon the men and told them to identify themselves. One of these men, a tall bearded man with a long black hat, was filling the airship with water from a nearby stream. He walked forward with a lantern and claimed him and his friends were crossing the country in an airship. They then took the lawmen to the aircraft for a closer look. The sheriff reported he was about 60 feet long and cigar shaped. The man tried to get the two to go aboard, stating they would fly to a spot where it was not raining, but the lawmen refused. The constable was a bit perplexed and didn't know exactly what to do. There were no actual laws being broken, so all he could do was let them go. And from here, sources vary but one states that the men told them they were on their way to Nashville and flew off. Another source claims the constable and the deputy went to perform their task, but on their way back through, they decided to drop back in and check on the men, but they were stunned to see there was no trace of the men or aircraft that remained, as they had already flown off. And to this day, no one knows for sure what exactly Constable John Sumter and his deputy John McLemore seen. We know that some of the earliest airships were built years before, but none of them were real feasible, and it was during this time frame that the constable reported the sighting that real usable airships were in the earliest stages of development in Europe. So is it possible some mad scientist out in the mountains of Arkansas had built his own homemade airship, or was it built somewhere else and they were trying to do a cross-country flight like they claimed? What's interesting about this story is there is no mention of aliens or anything paranormal. They were all very real human beings, flesh and blood pilots, on an aircraft that was obviously built by man. So that could give the story a little credence. In fact, in at least one source, I was able to find that a resident in Hot Springs had actually applied for a patent for a flying machine around this same time. He was denied the patent, but could this have been his craft? If it was, he never came forward after the story was printed. Not long after, a similar sighting happened to the east over the border of Mississippi. There was also at least one other sighting in Arkansas in the same time period where the pilot told a state senator, allegedly, that the aircraft was bound for Cuba to fight the Spanish, since tensions were on the rise then. May 20th, 1972 Dallas, Texas. 19-year-old Dee Dee Catherine Henson of the Pleasant Grove neighborhood would do as she did most days. The young housewife would get up and take her husband Arnold to work at around 6.45 a.m. Now the record is not clear on this one, but I'm going to assume the young couple only had the one vehicle. After she dropped him off, she headed closer to home and stopped at a nearby laundromat to do laundry at 7.30 a.m. Sometime around 8.45, she left and drove home, making it there around 10.30 a.m., where she would then begin removing laundry from her car and walked into the home. About two hours later, Arnold would call to talk to Dee Dee on his lunch, but she didn't answer. He at first was not alarmed, assuming that she was still out running errands. However, when she failed to arrive to pick him up after work, he knew something was wrong. Arnold would end up walking to his sister-in-law's home, who would then give him a ride the two could never be prepared for what they walked into next, because as they walked in, the first thing they would see were hair curlers and loose buttons from a blouse lying on the floor. Walking in further, they found Dee Dee, deceased in the bedroom, face down in her red robe. Her blouse with the missing buttons were nearby. Arnold quickly called the police. 
They arrived quickly, and detectives went over the scene. Dee Dee had put up a fierce struggle. As the evidence clearly showed, she had been bound with a man's shirt and a cloth belt had been used to gag her. She was then violated before the man shot her in the back of the head five times. Burn marks and gunpowder residue were left behind on a pillow, which was used to muffle the sound, most likely from a 22. Police began talking to neighbors and putting together a timeline. As mentioned, she made it home around 10.30 a.m., where she began taking laundry into the home. She was still wearing hair curlers and a blouse, and we know this because she was spotted by one of the young neighborhood boys. Detectives then found that shortly after she arrived home, a white car would drive into the sleepy neighborhood and slowly cruise down the street. Since one of Dee Dee's neighbors was having her house remodeled, one of the workers noticed the white car and thought it was odd. He said it was a white Ford sedan, 66 to 68 model, probably a Mustang or a Falcon, with a blue paint streak on the left rear bumper, which was damaged. The car would then slowly turn around and come back and pull into the driveway of Dee Dee. A man, about six foot tall, with brown hair and wearing a long sleeve white shirt, got out of the car and walked up to the porch. One of the other men working on this remodel would note that he had a large mole or pimple near his mouth. Sometime after this, the car was seen by another neighbor leaving and then accelerating to the nearest intersection, turning and speeding away. But detectives would speak to the postman, who delivered around 11.30 a.m., and they were certain Dee Dee was dead by that point. In addition, one of the other construction workers would note around the same time he came around to an angle where he could see Dee Dee's home, and the car and the man were gone for sure, but the front door was left wide open. Strangely though, investigators would state that she had been dead about 10 hours before Arnold arrived home at 7, which puts her death closer to 9 a.m. This, of course, did not match what the construction worker's timeline of events were, and instead would put her just leaving the laundromat. In fact, that's one of the oddities with this mystery. There's so many conflicting accounts and suspects, as we'll see later. The 9 a.m. estimated time of death may actually be more accurate because Dee Dee left the laundromat at 8.45, and that laundromat was only five minutes from her home. So leaving at 8.45 and making it home at 10.30 doesn't fit unless she ran some other errands, which no witnesses would attest to. In addition, the 9 a.m. timeline would get more proof when a woman and neighbor came forward and stated that at 9 a.m., she had heard a scream in the area. She did not become alarmed because she assumed he was coming from the very nearby elementary school and she thought he was just kids playing. About three hours later though, she seen a car pull into the driveway of Dee Dee and sit there for a few minutes staring at the home. This woman would also tell detectives that a strange man had been lurking around the neighborhood in the days prior, walking around and according to her, scanning homes. He had stopped at this neighbor's home a short time before the murder and asked to use the phone. He then thumbed through a phone book, dialed four numbers, and held the phone to his face for about 30 seconds, then hung up, stating nobody was there. She found this very odd, considering he dialed just four numbers. Also, within this few days before the murder, an individual who residents thought may be mentally ill was knocking on doors and asking people to vote for him because he was running for dog catcher, which of course, an animal control officer, is an appointed position. But apparently, this man left some neighbors a bit unsettled. Likewise, while at the laundromat that morning, one witness would tell police that a young white male was watching Dee Dee as he peered at her while standing near a vending machine, although it was noted he left before her. But it would get more complicated because for three years prior to this, Dee Dee and Arnold had been receiving strange phone calls very early in the mornings. It started about four months after their wedding in November 1969 ringing sometimes at 3 or 4 a.m. It was always an individual who just breathed heavily into the phone and sometimes had music playing in the background, but never spoke. These calls happened so much that they eventually changed their number and had it unlisted, yet the calls persisted and only stopped a week before the murder. And again, just a few months prior, around Christmas of 1971, Dee Dee would go to a camera store to buy Arnold a Christmas gift. It was here that a man followed her in and then just stared at her, making her very nervous. The store clerk would then use the camera 
to show Dee Dee how it worked. Taking the photo you see here, Dee Dee would demand the photo and left the store immediately. But these strange incidents don't stop here because one day, around this time frame, Dee Dee would pull up and stop at a busy intersection. The car behind her began accelerating and pushed Dee Dee's car out into traffic before the man drove off. However, police would run down all these leads and eventually ruled them out and continued to focus on the white Ford seen that morning. The only person of interest, or one that we know about publicly at least, was a 27-year-old man named Alfred Ray O'Neill, who was arrested just four months later in July for a robbery slash murder of two teenagers in Paris, Texas, about two hours away. He was sentenced to 40 years in that case, and at the time of Dee Dee's murder, he had lived close to her and Arnold and actually only worked about 20 minutes away. However, other than a hunch, the detectives had no real proof, as this was before the days of DNA, and the case eventually went cold. Arnold would die in 1991, and he was never suspected by the family or the police. This case is weird in a way. One of the big issues was there were too many persons of interest and too many conflicting accounts. Obviously, he was most likely the man in the white Ford, as police believed he forced his way inside on her, although they could not conclusively rule out the possibility that the driver of the white car was not involved, and instead, the killer may have already been inside the home waiting. But just who was this killer? Alfred O'Neill? The crazy dog catcher? Was it the mysterious person who called them for three years straight, never saying a word? Was it the man at the laundromat? Or the guy at the camera store? Or maybe it was the driver of the car that shoved her out into traffic? Or were none of these events connected to the murderer? It's a very confusing one, without much hopes of resolution. October 8, 1976, school teacher Mr. Wayne Dunlap of Knoxville, Tennessee was excited to take his class on a field trip, and since things were much different back then, permission slips weren't needed, and the teacher hadn't even told the students or the parents where they were going, as he wanted them to be surprised. About halfway through the trip, he would announce he was taking the horticulture class to the Clingman's Dome at Smoky Mountains to hike, but more specifically, to look at plant life and animals. And after about an hour and 50 minutes of driving, the students would cross over the state line into Swain County, North Carolina. The 38 students arrived around mid-morning and split up into two groups. And one of these groups had a young lady named Trini Gibson, who was 16 years old, who was interested in landscape architecture and hoped to study at UT. The trip also included her friend, Robert Simpson, who she sat with on the bus. Robert was a year older than her, but she had known him for a while because he was a friend of her older brother. And although they were friends, it's never been clear if they might have been more to it than that. The hike was listed as moderate difficulty, coming in at close to two miles long. The group were instructed not to deviate from the assigned route and to meet back at the entrance at 3.30 p.m. The students took multiple breaks and at one point stopped for lunch. At this point, Trini got cold and Robert gave her his jacket. Then he stated he wished to walk slower and stay behind so he could track a bear. Trini would then tell him she would run ahead and walk back with the other group of students, and she did just that, catching up with them as they were about a half a mile from the parking lot. The students would again decide to take a break. While doing so, she took a few steps ahead to look at something off of the trail. She would even crouch down and look as something had clearly gotten her attention. Meanwhile, the other group of students caught up with this group that was resting and everyone began to chat. Trini remained focused on whatever it was she was looking at off the path. When they were all ready to start walking back to the bus together, they turned and noticed Trini was missing. They initially thought she went back to the bus, but after arriving back at 3.30 p.m., they realized she was not there either. At this point, the teacher, Mr. Dunlap, had also become aware. He took another student with him, and they went back out on the trail to search. After about an hour of this, they found not one sign of Trini and reported her to the park rangers, and by 8 p.m., the parents were called. At some point, volunteer searchers were called in and came out with dogs and searched the last known location of Trini, but the search was hampered by wind, rain, and fog. They would follow the scent to the spot where the trail intersects with the Appalachian Trail. The dogs then followed it into the thick woods that led up to an area near the Clingman's Dome. 
where it then came out to a road and the scent trail stopped. The search would be caught off at 3 a.m. Most interestingly, searchers also came across broken ferns, empty beer cans, and cigarette butts near that spot on the road. The cigarette butts were the same brand as the ones found near where Trini was last seen. The whole thing was creepy. It seemed like she had been abducted, but how in the world could that have happened without one student seeing it? In fact, everyone on the trail that day reported seeing nothing suspicious. Investigators then wondered, did she walk off the trail, possibly to look at whatever it was that caught her attention, and got hurt? If so, why were no remains found? Well, detectives would get two early persons of interest. The first, Robert Simpson, whom Trini had sat on the bus with. Actually, she had spent most of the day with him. The fact he wanted to stay behind to track a bear seemed a bit odd. It led to conjecture that maybe Trini was looking in the direction of something she heard, and maybe this something was Robert trying to sneak up on her. In fact, some students would come forward days later and tell police that her comb was found on the dashboard in Robert's car. Of course, when Robert was asked about this, he told investigators she had left it in his car the day before their field trip. But this wasn't the only item of hers that ended up in someone else's possession. She had a star sapphire pendant and ring that had vanished. These would end up being found in the possession of another girl. And when questioned, that young lady would not say how she got them. But she stated she would give them back to Trini's parents, which she didn't do. This jewelry had more of a sentimental value to Trini, and the thought that she would just hand them over didn't make sense. But later on, another student would come forward and claim that Trini had supposedly given the jewelry to another girl to hold on to during the field trip, and then this girl gave the jewelry to the other student who refused to say how she got it. All in all, a bit suspicious. But back to Robert. He also said something strange. He told her family while they were there searching for her, if Kelvin Bowman has Trini, he will kill her. If he does not have her, I think she must have run off with some horny hitchhiker, which is certainly a weird statement to make. But just who was this Kelvin Bowman? Trini's parents wanted detectives to know about Robert's strange claim, so they looked into Kelvin and found that just a year earlier, he had actually broken into the home of the Gibson family, presumably because he had a crush on Trini. Her mother, scared, heard him in the house and would shoot him in the foot. He was then arrested, and at the trial, he threatened to harm Trini. He would only serve six months and was out before she disappeared. But this led to nothing because detectives quickly found out he was still in class at the time of the field trip. Over the years, there's been a ton of unconfirmed sightings. One group of hikers said they saw her sitting at the entrance of a cave. Another couple said she came to their home asking for money and to make a phone call. In this account, she had supposedly showed up in a car full of young men. The couple did not have money to give her, so she stormed off back to the car. However, law enforcement has dismissed all these sightings. As far as theories go, the FBI posited two. They believed she was abducted, likely where the trail intersected the Appalachian Trail. She was then hidden, possibly in the tower of the Klingman Dome when it was foggy, until it was safe to walk unseen to the spot at the road where the dogs traced her scent to. She was then taken out by vehicle. How this person got her to comply is unknown, but a gun was likely. Their second theory is that while walking ahead, she got lost and may have inadvertently taken the Appalachian Trail where she went up to Klingman's Dome. Seeing headlights, she made her way down to the road, but instead of finding help, she was abducted or met some kind of foul play. Another theory proposed was she just ran away, but there's zero evidence in support of this. While another theory cites she had some kind of wilderness mishap. Maybe she got lost and succumbed to the elements, or possibly was even attacked by a black bear, which are known to inhabit the Smokies. But again, one would think remains would be found. Others have speculated she hurriedly sped toward the bus to tell the teacher of an impending danger, such as someone planning to abduct her, but she was snatched off the path right at the last second. September 25th, 1988, Lake County, Florida. A man would get out of his car and walk over into a wooded marshy area in search of some cypress lumber. Little did he know what he would find instead would lead to a mystery that has not been solved in nearly 40 years because it was here he came across the body of a deceased woman, one 
who had been deceased for many months and was not recognizable, except for the fact that the remains did show long bleached blonde hair, a long denim skirt, blue-green tank top, manicured nails, and pantyhose which had been partially pulled down, which hinted at an assault. Judging by the location, it was likely she was dragged some 30 feet to this area from the side of the road. Police began to canvass the area, but found no identification. There was nothing left to do except take the skeletonized remains to a professional, and luckily, the University of Florida's Department of Anthropology had one of the best in the game. A famous forensic anthropologist, Dr. William Maples, the man was highly respected in the field and was considered to be the greatest in the nation. In fact, in this time frame, he was already conducting an analysis on the remains of Spanish explorer Francisco Pizarro and Joseph Merrick, aka the Elephant Man. So this Jane Doe would get one of the best examinations that there was to offer. Dr. Maples began and determined she was between 24 and 32 years old. It was around 5 foot 10 and had an athletic build. He found she had 250C silicone breast implants, which the doctor concluded would have looked proportional to her build. He also found many pits and ridges along her pelvic bones, which led him to conclude she had given birth more than once. He could not determine a cause of death, but police were certain it was a homicide, and that would be all the case for a long time. He would go cold over the next two decades until 2010, when major advances in DNA analysis came about, that the case would be brought back to the forefront, because it was at this time the state of Florida was making a huge push to solve some of these code cases with new technologies. The detective in charge of this case made sure that these unidentified remains were one of the ones that got tested with this new technology. It would take about five years, but detectives would finally get a break in 2015, and they were stunned because this Jane Doe was transgender. That's right. The expert doctor years ago that stated that she had more than one child, well, he was using the scientific knowledge of the time that led him to conclude that the pits and ridges he's seen on her pelvic bones were due to hormonal changes from pregnancy. But now, it was known that this came from hormone replacement therapy. The story would get a little bit of media coverage, and soon the name Julie Doe was given. The case obviously had issues from the start, but it's led to questions concerning family. Did Julie cut all contact in order to begin transitioning, as was probably the norm in the 80s? Or did the family live on the other side of the country and had no idea she had transitioned, thus filling out a missing persons report that was not accurate? Or had they totally disowned and cut off ties with Julie, thus never filing a missing persons report? What is likely is she had been in hormone replacement therapy for years, as well as having implants, meaning she needed money from somewhere. This has led to conjecture that her family might have been wealthy, and one of these estranged family members may have been sending money quietly to help her along. Of course, it's also possible Julie was involved in sex work. Another more sad thought comes from the discoveries made during the examination, such as Julie had a healed broken toe, rib, and cheekbones, which indicated a history of injuries or trauma. She also apparently had a rhinoplasty, which is probably to correct the injuries to her face. Further testing has been done over recent years, where ancestral ties have been found in the southeastern part of the country. This one is currently pretty active, and it's possible a resolution comes soon. Sometime around the year 1930, a man would get off the train in Crane, Missouri and make his way 10 miles east to the small farming community of Odo. He met a kind couple there named the Coxes who let him spend the night, and it was here that he would tell them he was fueled by wanderlust and that he had traveled far and wide before finding Odo, and he planned to stay a bit. He would eventually set up camp near the river on the property of the Coxes when something odd happened. This man, who called himself Omar Palmer, would soon be approached by a neighbor who asked if he would come see a woman with pneumonia. Now I have to stop here to clarify. It's unsure why these people suspected Omar was a doctor. That part of the story seems to be lost. However, he would go visit, and sure enough, he cured the woman that had pneumonia, although some sources say it was a farmer with an undiagnosed illness. In either case, he was able to heal the individual. Word of this spread fast thanks to a church potluck dinner 
which spread the gossip around town. Before long, the stranger who had wandered into town was being approached by numerous residents for a variety of ailments. He ended up carrying people with kidney infections. He delivered babies. He was said to have carried appendicitis, eye infections, rheumatism, styes, stomach issues, and even a case of polio. And in the event surgery was needed, he would refer them to a surgeon. However, in most cases, he just treated the patients with herbs. Soon, he opened up a clinic, and according to the record, he treated 7,000 patients within the first few months. And the catch? He was treating them for free. According to the 72-year-old doctor, he simply didn't need the money. He would start every morning at 4 o'clock when the patients first began to arrive. The local farmers would even complain that the flashing headlights from cars kept waking them up as people left early to reach the clinic and wait in hopes of being seen. The doctor typically treated more than 100 in a day, and one day, he seen up to 200 people. He often had to turn away a dozen or more patients who would usually come back the next day. Locals, of course, really took to this guy and began calling him the Wizard of Odo, and no small part because of the secrecy around him. In fact, Omar refused to tell anybody where he was from and what brought him to the Ozarks, and they were fairly sure Omar wasn't even his name. He hated for pictures to be taken of him. Heck, he didn't even want people describing what he looked like. And when asked about his past, he was always vague and evasive, and clearly did not want anyone in town to know anything about him. Of course, this much secrecy will only start more rumors, and many began to wonder if he was some kind of wanted criminal running from the law. Others speculated he may have headed one of the nation's top hospitals. Some speculated he graduated from three of the top universities in the country, but many believed his real skill was just entertainment. I mean, why would he come here? Odo was a tiny community with a post office, small store, barber shop, and church, and that was pretty much it. But within a few years of setting up this clinic, cars and trucks could be seen lined up in either direction, which is only made more odd by the fact that Omar never showed proof of having a medical degree. In fact, an investigation began in 1933, which led to him being arrested for practicing medicine without the proper paperwork, most likely because all the other doctors in the area were jealous and reported him. But these changes were eventually dropped when no one came forward to testify that they had paid for his services. Although Omar would not allow his face to be seen, he did do an interview with the newspaper, and when asked about his identity, he claimed he was not running from anything in his past. He didn't do anything dishonorable or criminal. He instead retired from the outside world, discarded his previous name, and separated from his past. He claimed to have had a nervous breakdown and came to the quiet backwoods to get rest. When the reporter replied he was not getting any rest because he was seeing numerous patients, he countered it was his destiny to help. The stories began to spread, and papers started to run more articles about him, stating he was more a healer than a medical doctor. Soon, other accounts popped up of people coming and sitting for days or a week in what might be termed a festival-like atmosphere, with picnics, campfires, and all, just waiting around to see the good doctor, who seemed to be more of a miracle worker. People began to come from all over. Very little was known about his treatments, other than he used herbs, charcoal, kerosene, and would apply a soft material coated in sugar and turpentine to treat inflammation and soreness. Many noted he was sort of a spiritual doctor, believing the spirit would heal the body, although others would say he was just giving patients hope and the motivation to take better care of themselves. Meanwhile, at the town center of Hurley, town leaders took notice, and they reached out to him in 1934, promising support and to build him a new, larger clinic. And the town, knowing these people were traveling from far away, had to have somewhere to eat, and sometimes they needed somewhere to bed down for the night. So, it was an economic opportunity that could not pass up. Meanwhile, Omar would begin to hire locals to gather herbs, roots, and other naturals, and soon the Odo Remedy Company was started, which sowed medicinal herbs all over the country, which provided a nice income for Palmer and his wife. Oh, and I should note here, the 72-year-old Omar had met and married a local 27-year-old woman who had a young daughter. The two would go on to have two kids of their own. A few years later, Omar would move his clinic to Aurora, Missouri, about a 25-minute drive away, and just as quickly as it began, it ended. 
because in 1938, after seeing thousands of patients and gaining a nationwide following, he closed his clinic and moved away. He would pass away just eight years later in Prairie Grove, Arkansas in April 1946, and just as mysteriously as he arrived, he would exit, as his wife had purchased 10 plots in a cemetery, but only Omar would ever be buried there. There was no clue left on his grave either, just a tombstone with the name O.A. Palmer, 1861-1946. And a few years later, his herbal remedy company would vanish as well, almost a century later, and nothing is known about the doctor who treated thousands of patients for free in a small town in Missouri for nearly a decade. June 6th, 1877. A story would find its way into the small town Alabama newspaper to documented the strange encounter that a man named Marcus L. Foster witnessed. Foster, who owned a plantation at the mouth of Ball Play Creek, which is about 20 minutes northwest of Piedmont, Alabama, and was not far from the Georgia border, Foster had decided to go down the Coosa River to set out some bank cooks, and as he made his way down to his boat, he noticed on the other side of the river a man paddling his boat, but since it was a good distance away, he could not say for sure who it was, but he assumed it must be an acquaintance of his, so he stepped down to his boat and started paddling over to see him. As the two got near each other, Foster began to second guess himself. Now, at around 100 yards away, he could have swore it was a woman standing in the water. This woman had her body about three to four feet out of the water, and she was not standing still. In fact, she was moving along the shore. Foster was perplexed and just had to move closer. As he got near, he seen something he would have never guessed. This was not a woman at all. To his shock, it was a serpent, or some kind of water creature, with a head and a long erect neck extending out of the water about three to four feet. Its head looked like that of a horse's head, with large glaring eyes and a mouth that extended open showing a fiery red tongue. The cryptid showed no signs of fear, but stared at Foster as it passed. Foster, for his part, started making a quick retreat back to the bank, where he stood and watched the animal swimming back and forth, where at a distance, still looked like a man in a boat. The cryptid would finally swim off and plunge into the depths. Now Foster was not a man known to tell tales, and he was a respected man of the community, so he decided it was probably best not to speak of this, because he was afraid of being mocked and having his reputation ruined. Actually, we wouldn't even know about this account if it hadn't been for another witness, a man named James M. Elliott, who seen the creature while him and an unnamed individual were out on their pleasure boat. They described the creature as being 40 feet in length, with a body as large as a hog's head. This led to more people coming out about their own sightings. One, a Judge Lemmy Standifer, a highly respected man, had, on occasion, when crossing the river in a canoe, heard a noise like a distant thunder behind him. He claimed to have turned around to see about 30 to 40 yards away a creature with an enormous body and head and neck that stretched 14 to 15 feet above the water and would then gradually sink back into the depths and disappear. Over the next several years, numerous sightings would take place, specifically between Gaston, Alabama and Rome, Georgia, and they were taken as credible and the newspapers even warned parents to keep their children away from the river. Although the aforementioned reports described the creature as being 40 foot, most accounts described it as being around 20 feet with the head and neck of a horse and black skin that was covered in scales. Some reports mentioned that it had a white underbelly and large knots on its back, while all accounts stated it moved through the water like a serpent. And although these sightings we discussed came from the late 19th century, the earliest sightings actually took place in the early 1800s. It's even said that the first official report came from a letter in 1816 which mentioned that a number of St. Clair County settlers near Ten Islands had killed a sea monster that appeared ill. When they opened up the creature, it had recently eaten a human, his canoe, a deer, a bow with arrows, and a rifle. Although this creature is never described, many attribute it to the Coosa River monster. And going even further back, the Creek and Cherokee Indians have similar accounts of a serpent, or serpents, living within the river. The biggest spike in sightings popped up in the mid-1900s 
When several dams were being constructed in the area, it was also at this time the stories began to circulate that the creature was responsible for the deaths and disappearances of several farm animals in the area. However, there's never actually been any concrete proof that this creature exists. In fact, an early theory on this one came just five years later in 1882, when researchers posited that the serpent-like beast was nothing more than a mass of leaves forcing its way up by gases created as they decayed. Once they broke the surface, the gases would dissipate with a sound similar to a snort or a roar. Other speculation is that of a giant catfish, specifically a channel cat or blue cat. They can grow to pretty big lengths. Blue cats specifically are one of the largest freshwater fish in North America. Sticking with the fish line of thinking, some have theorized that what these people were really seeing was actually a sturgeon, another huge fish. They also have long bodies and snout and have rows of bony plates running along their bodies and could, at a glimpse, look like a serpent. Others have suggested the whole thing was a hoax or mass hysteria. October 5th, 1980, Wiggins, Mississippi. A story would start in the way we have heard multiple times now, that of two hunters who were walking through a thicket when one of them, 21-year-old, Don Ainsworth would walk up onto something that stopped him in his tracks, a skull, peeking out from a bush. He peered at the skull for a second, wondering what animal it could have came from, and it's then that he looked closer to see locks of amber-brown hair still attached to it. He would yell for his younger brother Kent, who had walked ahead, to come back. It was here the two brothers would study over the horrific find. The body was laid up against an old fence row, and a bush had grown out around it. And although remains were mostly just a skeleton, they could tell from the length of hair that it was female. Also wrapped around the bones was a now tattered trash bag which had fallen apart over time. The boys rushed home to tell their father, who in turn called the police. Detectives arrived and took statements and sent the remains to the state crime lab since they could not find anything in the way of evidence. But they did assume the remains were from someone that was not local as there had not been any missing persons reported. And it's because of this fact the Biloxi, Mississippi PD would get involved. See, they had a missing person case that stemmed back to just five months prior in May. And it's a mystery we have already taken a look at in this series. Back in part six, you may recall the story of 61-year-old Marguerite Peggy Maiden, the avid amateur golfer who vanished from her home. When police searched it, they found a trail of blood that had been haphazardly cleaned up. Then a few days later, her car was found at a hotel parking lot. Well, when news spread of this unidentified person, the town of Biloxi became very interested because they feared these were the remains of Peggy. But the state crime lab returned a report that dashed those hopes because this woman had been deceased for only three to four months, which would be too short amount of time to be Peggy. Also was the fact that this unidentified woman was too young to be her and their heights and dental records were different. Peggy would never be found, and it's thought she was killed by the Dixie Mafia. But the identity of this person wasn't the only mystery. The location was very odd as well, because in the thicket along the fence line sat an old abandoned home that had been abandoned for many years and had even caved in. The land actually belonged to an employee at the sheriff's department who used a neighboring field to grow cucumbers, which indicated that someone from out of town most likely drove until they found a safe rural place to dump the body, as most locals knew that the property here belonged to a member of law enforcement and would not likely dump a body there. Meanwhile, further investigations would be done upon the body, and it was found that the Jane Doe, now named Miss Wiggins, was between 32 and 45 years old, 5 foot 3 and 5 foot 6, with reddish brown hair. She also had expensive dental work done and possibly suffered a back injury in a car accident as a teenager, although she was also deemed athletic, so it could have been a sports injury. She was also likely to have been tied up and strangled. As far as who she was or what she was doing here, there's been various theories. Of course, the one that always gets brought up was she was a sex worker, but not everyone agreed with this. There was actually an early theory that Miss Wiggins was a wealthy woman who had a career in public relations. Where they got this idea is not really elaborated on. Others believed she was a dancer or performer from Vegas 
citing one of the only clues, that of a torn piece from an entertainment publication called The Las Vegas Mirror, dated March 14, 1980, which was found in her pocket. Also, her being a dancer could explain the back injury, as spinal stress injuries are common among dancers, and with very little else to go on, the case went cold for years, when police would get an interesting phone call in 2013. That from a local resident, Christy Johnson, who teaches forensics at the University of Southern Mississippi. She had actually investigated code cases for other law enforcement agencies in the state, and she was passionate about solving Miss Wiggins' case. She had actually learned about it from an officer in a different county, and after looking into it, she was sucked in. She dove in, following old leads using new forensic tools. She re-interviewed witnesses like the boys that had found the remains, as well as the old detectives, and also digging through old file cabinets looking for every little piece of data she could find. In the decades since her taking on the case, she has compiled a detailed binder on Miss Wiggins, from medical examiner reports, facial reconstructions, DNA profiles, and other forensics. Autherm Labs would do their thing and were finally able to determine an origin for the woman. She was half Brazilian and then half Syrian or half Lebanese, which is a bit of a surprise, and it's led to speculation that Miss Wiggins was an immigrant or child of immigrants or possibly just a traveler, which is actually quite possible because New Orleans, a big tourist destination, is only about an hour and a half drive from Wiggins, and it fit a theory that the original detectives had on this case, which was Miss Wiggins and the Harrison County Jane Doe, an unidentified woman's remains that were found just a month after Miss Wiggins and just 30 minutes away in neighboring Harrison County could be connected, and the murderer could have picked both of these women up in New Orleans and then transported them to rural dumping grounds in Mississippi. As far as familial DNA goes, no relatives have been found yet, but Johnson and law enforcement are holding out that the right person submits their DNA and solves this 40-year-old mystery soon. In the time we have been covering mysteries on this channel, we have looked at some weird graves and tombs, but there may be no more controversial grave we have covered than the mystery grave in Van Buren, Arkansas. The grave is a bit unusual, and it's enclosed with old stones and is clearly very old. Actually, it's even older than the town, and nobody actually knows how it got there. And since this is a pretty straightforward mystery, I'll jump right into the theories. The first, and maybe most often talked about person who is buried here, is a member of the Hernando de Soto expedition, the famous Spanish explorer who paraded all up and down the south in 1542, becoming the first European to ever do so, before dying on the banks of the Mississippi. De Soto's route, at best, is heavily debated, since the chronicles are kind of vague, although some historians believe they made it to the Arkansas River Valley. It's even possible they did make it to Van Buren. In fact, a plaque was once attached to the footstone that suggested it was one of De Soto's men, but that disappeared sometime before 2010. But even if they did make it here, who's to say they would have buried someone here? Outside the fact the grave is really old, there's not much really else to go by, although the grave is oriented in the typical east-west alignment with the head of the grave facing east, as traditional Christian burials have been for a long time, which has left the door open for other researchers, the more fringe ones, like the ones who believe the Vikings were traveling across America hundreds of years before the Spanish. It seems some believe the Vikings made it to Arkansas as well. A lot of this goes back to the Heavener runestone found in Oklahoma, which we have discussed in a prior video. The stone is alleged to be made by Vikings, and that stone is only about a 50 minute drive from Van Buren. It's also directly upriver from Paris, Arkansas, which is home to another runestone, and proponents of this theory state that the Vikings were already in the area and they just used these big stones around the grave. Another theory was that it was actually from the La Salle expedition carried out by the French in 1682 and holds the remains of two men from that journey. Others claim it is a Native American grave, possibly the final resting place of a Christianized Cherokee. Others pitch a more grounded theory that the grave is part of and clearly aligned with other graves in the plot of the Thompson family one of the earliest pioneer families in Van Buren, and it also has a crude inscription resembling a Masonic compass and square, albeit upside down. Finally, some researchers state that the stone-style grave is really not that unique, 
and they can be found throughout the South, especially ones from the 1820s, as it was a common practice on the frontier to do this to keep animals from digging up the remains, which has led to the more boring theory that this was actually a person who died in the 1820s and was a Mason and probably a member of the Thompson family. November 26, 1977, South Knoxville, Tennessee. Two teenage boys would go out for a hike near the Cherokee Trail on a cold morning just a few days after Thanksgiving. As they made their way up the path, the two would discover a morbid sight. There, on the trail, lay a dead body, but not in the way you might imagine. I mean, the boys could obviously tell it was a murder, but the details were especially terrible. The man's head was taken off at the shoulders, the hands were severed a few inches above the wrist, the legs just a few inches above the knees, with two deep gashes across the chest and one wound to the upper arm, which is probably made to remove a tattoo or some kind of identifying mark. And finally, the victim's genitals had been removed. At first, Knoxville detectives speculated that the man may have been cut up by chainsaw, but dropped this theory upon closer examination because they soon realized it had been done with a fine tooth saw. Regardless, the missing body parts were never recovered, and obviously, they assumed that it had been done to hide identification, except for the genitals, which suggested a very personal motive, most likely jealousy. Also at the scene was a length of rope found wrapped around the torso, as well as blood stains and marks on the ground, which suggested the murder occurred somewhere else and the body was dumped here. The medical examiner was also able to determine that the person had been deceased for only about six to eight hours, but the mystery was twofold. Who was responsible for this, and who was the victim? The latter question would be answered first, maybe, because shortly after the murder made local news, a missing persons report was filed for a man named Paul Wayne Hurst. But detectives weren't sure the two were connected, because authorities originally assumed the unidentified victim was in his 30s, and maybe even younger, due to the youthful looking torso, while Paul Wayne Hurst was 54. But this could be explained though, because you see, Paul Wayne Hurst was a former Gold Gloves welterweight boxing champion, and he exercised religiously every morning and had an excellent diet. He also spent much of his time coaching and mentoring young boxers. So now that the investigators knew they had a much older man who kept himself in top shape, they deemed it was most likely the body belonging to Hurst. This would be made official a week later when the medical examiner compared spinal x-rays of the torso to that of Hearst, who had been treated for a back injury years earlier. Although some were confident it was Hearst, the case would be slowed down by second guessing by authorities and family members as to whether it was actually Paul or not. It led to the body being exhumed less than a year later. Still, investigators looked for motives to murder Paul and couldn't find any. He had founded a youth boxing program and was well known as a mentor and was loved by the students he had taught. The 54-year-old could still handle himself well too, and whoever was responsible almost certainly had to use a weapon and did not take him on physically. Within the first two months, detectives would interview more than 100 people, but the case had not made any progress. Then it would slow down even more because Paul's son, Sonny, would hire two private investigators, and they, along with the coroner and the Hearst family doctor, all stated without a shadow of a doubt, the body in the grave was not Paul Hurst. This was in spite of the fact that the torso shared the same rare O negative type blood, while Paul's family pointed out there was evidence of a hernia operation that had taken place on the torso, while Paul had never had one. The body also had an extra nipple on the right side, while Paul only had one. With DNA testing a long ways off, the arguing would continue. What could be said either way though, was Paul would never be seen again. So detectives continued to work on that angle and once again began looking for motives. His own son would quit his job as an insurance adjuster and became a licensed private eye who spent years running down leads. He uncovered vague rumors that it involved organized crime, but none of these panned out. Although, it was actually around this same time that another local resident named Ronnie Sellers, who had been a student of Paul's, would begin a campaign of posting flyers and walking around with signs that read, the torso of 1977 was not Paul Hurst. Apparently, Sellers had fought a then unknown up-and-coming boxer named Sugar Ray Leonard in 1973 and almost beat him. He implied that Paul's disappearance 
was related to that, or, more specifically, the organized crime involved with that. The sheriff's department, however, looked a bit closer to home. They found out that just two months before the murder, Paul and his wife Reba had divorced, yet they still lived together and slept in different rooms. She told detectives that they had went to dinner on Tuesday night and then Paul took a week off from his job to go on a trip, which he did not share the details of. She did not see him again and only knew he was missing after his brother reported him so the following Monday. She didn't say much of anything else other than Paul came and went as he pleased. They did seize items from the home, such as a saw, hatchet, mattress, and bed. The FBI examined them, but the lab tests were inconclusive. Meanwhile, detectives found a surprising thing about Paul's life that many did not know about. He was pretty socially active. He apparently had several girlfriends. Women loved him and just couldn't get enough. And he apparently was getting phone calls from these ladies at home, whom he shared with his ex. And detectives would soon find that his other son, Steve, was upset about his father's affairs and actually bugged the home phone at his mother's request to listen in to the conversations he was having with these women. Detectives would interview both wife and son again, but it never went anywhere. The case would go cold for about eight years, when in 1985, a FBI special agent based in Knoxville would come forward with information. Apparently, he had a confidential informant who told him that he went to junior college with the same son who bugged his phone, as well as a strange individual known as Richard Russell. This man was said to have had a short temper and drank heavily, and apparently always carried a handgun and claimed he was a mercenary in Vietnam. One night when out drinking, this mysterious individual would make the claim that he killed Paul Hurst for messing around with his girlfriend. The case file never elaborates on how serious the sheriff's office took this information, though. It's been over four decades since the infamous Knoxville Torso murder, and little progress has been made. His son, Sonny, who became a private eye, did eventually come around to the belief that the torso did belong to his father, but has downplayed involvement by his mother or other family members. May 20th, 2018, Asheboro, North Carolina. 28-year-old Nancy Troche Garcia would take her six-month-old daughter over to the home of her ex-boyfriend slash baby's father to spend time with him. Nancy would then leave and later that evening would stop by her ex-boyfriend's sister where she asked if she could help her brother take care of the baby for a while because Nancy, who was now a United States citizen, needed to travel back to Mexico to visit her mother who was very sick. The baby's aunt agreed and Nancy left. But what would play out over the next few days is very curious because after no one heard from her the next three days, a co-worker would eventually call police to do a welfare check. And when they arrived to her apartment, Nancy was nowhere to be found. But obviously the thought was, she must be in Mexico with her mother, right? Well, that was the thing. When authorities were finally able to get into contact with her mom, not only had her mom not seen Nancy, but her mother was not sick at all. In fact, her mother would tell police that she last spoke to Nancy about a week before she disappeared and she was acting normal and didn't mention anything about visiting. Her family began to fear the worst and soon they thought something must have happened in Mexico, but there was no record of her getting on a flight, nor did her vehicle even cross the border. Investigators would soon request the phone records of Nancy and found out that she made a few phone calls after her disappearance. Some of these were to an out-of-state number. They also eventually had access to her Google account, which showed her Google Maps that she used to go to a dealership in Madison, North Carolina, about 55 minutes away. However, there was no record that she actually purchased anything at the car lot, nor did the salesman remember her. The Google account also revealed he was logged into once in January 2019, almost a year after her disappearance. And the strange part? It was about 30 miles from her hometown in Mexico where her mother was at. After contacting authorities in Mexico, nothing panned out. Her family, of course, have stated she would not have left her daughter willingly, citing the baby was born premature and was still breastfeeding. Meanwhile, detectives state there is no evidence of foul play occurring and that it is one of the most puzzling cases they have ever had. And other than Nancy telling her ex and his sister that she was going to Mexico, she told no one else anything of the sort. In the time since, police have conducted interviews with Nancy's ex, his family, Nancy's friends, 
and numerous other people in her life, and not one lead has came from this, and there has also not been any sightings or traces of her since the day she left. January 1977, Jasper County, Mississippi, will play host to our very next bizarre cryptid story, because according to the Jasper County newspaper, a farmer in the Nazarene community would go out one morning to feed his pigs when he noticed one of them had its ears sheared off completely. The removal was so fine, it was remarked that it could have been done with scissors. This would be followed upon the next night when another hog was attacked, but the predator was not done because it happened a third night in a row. However, this time, the farmer, Joseph Dixon, was waiting, and when he heard the commotion, he looked out to see an animal standing next to the pen. He first described it as being a canine, but bigger than the biggest German Shepherd. Actually, he would even say he was bigger than the biggest dog he had ever seen, and if it stopped here, that would be one thing, but the attacks continued, because a week later, his neighbor, Calvin Martin, would wake up to find one of his pigs had its ears pulled out completely. The attacks led to a pretty tense situation among the farming community, as the beast ended up hitting nine different farms over the next few weeks. The animal was never seen close, but going by Dixon's description, in several large canine tracks that were found leaving farms, it was some kind of dog-type creature. The ones who did catch glimpses of it, though, stated it was a canine with black fur, six feet long, and standing waist high to a man. Whatever it was, its jaws were strong enough to bite the head off of a 50 pound hog, which it did in at least one attack. And in another attack, it tried to decapitate a 300 pound hog, but eventually gave up and just tore its ears out. Law enforcement took the report seriously, and soon they found a pack of small feral dogs that were either part of a pack with this huge cryptid, or they simply were following it at a distance and then eating the leftovers. But they never got close to whatever was behind the pig ear attacks, and it's unknown where the cryptid went to next. Lake Okeechobee of South Florida covers 730 square miles, which makes it the 10th largest body of fresh water in the U.S., but it's one of the most shallow in the country, averaging around 9 feet deep. It's had a long connection to the weird and unexplained phenomena going back for decades, and that might be why many Native Americans never settled in large numbers near the lake. It was actually the early settlers that would first call this place home, and it's these settlers that would first give us accounts of our next mystery, because prior to 1910, the earliest pioneers would report finding human skeletons in the shallows around the southern end of the lake. Fishermen would also report pulling up skulls in their nets, claiming there were so many that during times of low water, it was like looking down at a pumpkin patch. By the early 1900s, a surveyor was sent to clear the land on Grassy Island, where he documented finding more than 50 skeletons covered with just a couple of inches of sand. And this was not a case of burials either, because this spot he was standing used to be a lake bottom, but the water level was dropped by a drainage canal. By 1918, the water level in the lake would drop to an all-time low due to a drought, and revealed hundreds of human remains laying around in the silt below. They had not been laid there in an orderly fashion either. For example, like a burial. No, they were scattered, and the bones belonged to adults and children alike. So, where in the world have all these remains came from? Well, the first theory was an obvious one, an ancient hurricane. However, one problem with this was the fact that prior to 1900, Few people lived around Lake Okeechobee, which seemingly rules out mass casualties from a flood or storm. The next theory that would be brought up would be the Seminole Wars, which was actually a set of three conflicts taking place between 1816 and 1858 and involved the United States fledgling government and the Seminoles and their allies. But only one skirmish took place near the lake, and that was the 1837 Battle of Lake Okeechobee, which resulted and 30 dead total, thus ruling it out. Interestingly, there are no Spanish accounts of the bones, and historians believe they actually go back for thousands of years, while some speculate that it's the remains of a huge Indian village that was wiped out by warfare or disease, but that opens up another question. Where are all the artifacts and pottery from this huge village? 
there are none found in the area, suggesting there was no village. Another theory brought up is that a local tribe traveled to the lake to dispose of their dead over a period of years as part of a ritual and then anchored them to the bottom of the lake, but this contradicts the bones being scattered. After this, the theories get a little more out there, with one suggesting the 200 Seminole warriors slit their throats and launched themselves into the water to avoid being captured by the American forces, but this story is usually just taken as a legend, and it's not even sure that the story was supposed to have happened at the lake. Others cite a legendary lost tribe that was referenced by other Native Americans, and then you get the paranormal ones like refugees from Atlantis or aliens. January 30th, 2019, Parkersburg, West Virginia, John DiMarino would walk into a local bar wearing his red hoodie and a beanie. The 51-year-old had gotten divorced only five months earlier and had moved back in with his mother, and it was his mother's vehicle that brought him to the bar that night. He would find a place to sit, lay down his iPhone and car keys, and order a beer. Around midnight, after drinking half of it, he got up and walked off. The employee thought John had went to the restroom, but he never returned. This would be the beginning of a sad mystery with very little info. Because after John got up to walk away, he would never be seen again. He did not contact anybody else, which was definitely a bad sign because he stayed into constant contact with his children, one a high school senior, the other in college. After a short time of not reaching out to anyone, he was quickly reported missing, and it would be four days later that the vehicle he was driving, which belonged to his mother, was found three and a half hours away in Conneaut, Ohio. The car was found sitting at a Love's truck stop. The vehicle was unlocked, and there were no signs that anything had been taken. The car contained a cell phone charger, an empty bag of chips, and change in the cup, but otherwise in clean condition, and it was not processed for a potential crime. Instead, it was hauled back to his mother's. Police have stated the foul play can't be ruled out, and that the car may have been driven there to throw off the police. But it's also worth noting that he had been staying with his mother in Spencer, which was an hour south of Parkersburg, in the opposite direction of where the car was found. But having said all that, investigators have stated, with the technology available today, it's hard for someone to just vanish, even if they're trying to do so intentionally. The cell phone data was looked at, and was found that the last known ping came from a tower near Elizabeth, which is about halfway between the bar and the town his mother lived in. But the strange thing that goes against him disappearing voluntarily was he had just bought tickets to a basketball game where him and his son had plans to attend. As far as motives go, well, there's not any. He didn't have a criminal history or any run-ins with the law, which has left many to speculate that he never left that bar to begin with. In fact, the key part in all this is the one employee who stated that going by the direction John was walking in, he assumed he was going to the restroom. Is it possible that version of events did not really happen? Is it possible that John had more than a half a beer like the employee claimed? Did he have way too much and an accident occurred and was covered up? Then his car was driven over three hours away to throw off investigators. Or maybe he walked out of the bar at midnight and something happened in the parking lot. Or Maybe something happened wherever he stopped to get chips. But it's important to note that although law enforcement could not rule out foul play, they also stated there was no signs of it. So is it possible that John, going through a divorce and living with his mother at 51, just wanted to start over somewhere else? It would seem not likely considering the tight relationship he had with his kids, but it seems no one has an answer. In 2018, author Simon Young would publish a book that he had spent the past few years working on. This book, well, it was a strange one. It was called The Fairy Census, 2014-2017, to and the work was just a collection of fairy experiences that he had collected from numerous people. The quote-unquote census came from an online survey where he asked people that had experiences with the mythical creature to fill out a form. The witness would then record their gender, the year that took place, age, location, how the actual encounter went, etc, etc. In doing this, he would take the most credible sightings 
and encompass them into this book. And it's here we explore our next mystery, because one of these accounts came from Arkansas. The person surveyed was now an adult woman who recalled being a teen in the 1990s in a forest in Arkansas. The town was not documented. She would reveal that on this afternoon, her and her little sister, who was six years old, were playing in the woods behind their grandparents' home with the family dog. She would state that their grandparents' property was pretty good-sized, so they often went to the back side of the yard to explore. It was a hilly area with a good-sized creek that ran through it where the girls played at often. But this day, her six-year-old sister was out ahead of her, and off to the right, over the top of the hill and down the creek she went. Meanwhile, the dog stayed back with her. As she started to walk after her sister, her dog would stop immediately and stare. The dog then leaned against her and its hair stood up, but he didn't bark or growl. He just kept staring to the left. Now this girl knew her sister went to the right, so she wasn't sure exactly what the dog was looking at to the left, but it didn't take her long to find out. Because when she started looking around to the area where her dog was staring, she seen a woman, a woman wearing a long white dress that began to walk towards her. And in spite of leaves being on the ground, there was no crunching. Actually, there was no noise at all. It was completely silent and still. The birds, wind, and everything in the forest just stopped. It was eerily quiet. The so-called fairy was beautiful. She glowed a little and was brighter than everything else around her. Her hair was a dark blonde color and was long and loose and she wore a long white dress. She would look at the young girl and smile and wave, who stated she felt shocked and just kept staring at her. Her dog finally made a bit of noise and pushed up against her leg more. It was this that caused her to look down at him, and when she looked back up, the fairy was gone. The report would go on to mention that her younger sister never seen a thing. Fairy sightings are not reported as often as ghosts or other paranormal experiences, but they do get reported quite a bit, and they've been reported just as long as ghost sightings have. In fact, one account from 1797 in Ireland reported seeing a huge number of fairies marching in military formation, and that is not unusual either, as a lot of reported sightings involve multiple fairies. So what's going on? Well, in this one, there's actually a pretty good theory. Charles Bonnet Syndrome is a medical condition that stems from someone that loses some or all their vision. It can cause them to have hallucinations and it's pretty common with different types of vision loss. What happens is when people lose their vision from disease or age-related issues, their visual system doesn't process new images, so the brain fills in the void by making up images or recall stored images for you to see. This results in people seeing things from patterns of lines to imaginary creatures like dragons and fairies. It's not stated in this account from Arkansas, but I do wonder if this young girl, who is now an adult woman recalling the story, had vision issues. If so, that would explain what she's seen. But you still have the people that believe seeing fairies comes from a supernatural ability to see things others cannot, and that these fairies are possibly spirits of the dead, or possibly even angels. Others believe the whole thing was a fabricated account. Lake Charles, Louisiana, May 10th, 1973, 8.59 a.m. The Lake Charles Police Dispatcher would get a call from a horrified customer at a children's shoe store. The woman had walked in to buy some shoes for her kids, but what she found was a woman lying on the floor, moaning and bleeding profusely. Officers in an ambulance were immediately dispatched to the scene. When they walked in, they found the owner of the store, Marion Pierce, laying on the floor. Her face was covered in blood, while her head was resting in a pool of blood. It was pretty gruesome. Her injuries had been caused by blunt force trauma. Detectives would begin the task of going over the scene, and found a fierce struggle had taken place. The shoe stand was knocked down and broken, and there was blood on two boxes on a bench. During the medical exam, Marion also was found to have large bruises on her shoulders and upper arms, suggesting whoever done this had forcibly tried to hold her still. Unlike other cases we have looked at, this one actually came up with a wealth of clues. In Marianne's purse was found a bloody fingerprint on her wallet. Then, there was a lone cigarette on the corner of the porch of the store. They also found an empty cigarette pack inside, 
but even more eerie was there was one lit cigarette still sitting in an ashtray inside the store. Now detectives felt strongly that the customer who had walked in had interrupted the assault, prompting the criminal to flee out the back. Investigators would also find a cloth money bag which had been emptied, as well as finding that money had been taken from the register. But all this still did not amount to over $200, making investigators question if robbery was really the motive. In spite of the brutality of the attack, Marion held on for a while. She was taken to a local hospital where she was listed in critical condition. Sadly, she never regained consciousness. Unable to describe her attacker, she passed away two days later at the age of 42, leaving six children behind. The difficult task of finding the perpetrator now began, and unlike some investigations we cover, the Lake Charles PD went all out. First, they wanted to find that weapon, so they cut the grass of numerous nearby yards and fields in order to search for it. They then drained a canal near the store, and nothing was found. For the next two days, they set up roadblocks driving by the store, where they took down every license plate with the assumption that the drivers would take that same route the same time every day. And this was not because they thought the suspect was going to drive by. What they hoped was that these drivers would recall seeing something odd in the area on the day of the murder. Meanwhile, they began extensive questioning, starting around the store and moving out into the surrounding neighborhoods. The investigation was huge, but sadly, led to nothing. The case went cold, and in 2016, new DNA analysis was performed on the remaining evidence, and nothing has came from this thus far either, leaving many to wonder who exactly would do this and why. Was it really a robbery, or was there a more deviant motive? Decades ago in the tiny community of Calvary, Georgia, a population of around 130 would play host to this next bizarre unexplained phenomenon. The story would begin on a Friday afternoon in the spring, when a couple of young boys had just gotten out of school. The two, who were cousins, were walking down the old country road, laughing and talking when they passed the Piedmont Primitive Baptist Church, one of the oldest churches in the state. It's here they would notice on the opposite side of the church, where the graveyard was, a burial taking place. And this funeral was impressive, one the caliber never seen in the area before. The procession was led by a blue wagon, being drawn by two white mules, while the mourners walked along wearing nothing but black. The entire scene was silent, not even could the mule-drawn cart be heard. Then, coming up from behind the mourners, were the rest of the procession which was made up of various colors of the rainbow, where they all moved and spread out across the cemetery yard, again, in complete silence. Once through the grave, they stopped, lifted the coffin from the wagon, and lowered it into the grave, and then began to fill it with dirt. Soon, they re-entered the wagon, and the buggies moved off, passing over other graves and everything else in the way. And then, the whole procession got out onto the road and disappeared into the mist, the young boys were stunned at what they had just seen. They knew all the people, as well as the one being buried. After it vanished into thin air, they would rush home to tell the boy's mother. And here was the eerie catch. His mother forbid him from telling their Uncle Jay and Aunt about this story because in that casket was their little girl, the boy's little cousin, who was very alive and very healthy. But by the following weekend, just eight days later on Saturday, that young girl would die and be buried, as she would be carried in the same exact manner that they had just witnessed the week before, fulfilling the premonition these two young boys had. That story was taken from the Logansport, Indiana Pharaoh's Tribune, dated April 2nd, 1889, and covers a phenomenon that is very rare in America with only a few accounts, but can be found throughout history in Europe, especially the British Isles, Germany, and Switzerland. It's called phantom funerals. It's where someone, or in this case, two young boys, witness a funeral procession that is sort of like a preview to a real funeral of a person who is still living. The anomaly can only be seen or heard, but never both at once, which explains why these boys never heard a sound. The accounts typically involve one person from a group witnessing it, usually the person with the gift. They are typically described as passing down the middle of roads and then going to a church where the burial is performed nearby. 
Witnesses typically describe a feeling of lost time in these events, or at night, seeing balls of light that look like little candles moving with the procession. And of course, the very real funeral, the mirror is the phantom one, will often take place just a few days later. Explanations for phantom funerals are, of course, usually connected to supernatural events, but there are more mundane theories, such as misidentification. For example, in one of these documented events, what the person really seen was an undertaker who was simply returning home late at night in his hearse, and at a distance gave the illusion that a funeral was taking place. But what these two boys seen this day is still unknown. November 21st, 1985, North Augusta, South Carolina, which sits right on the state line with Georgia. Donna Smith would come home from her late work shift around 1 a.m. The tired mother of two would quickly go to sleep, knowing she had to wake back up early the next morning since her husband worked day shift. So at 7 a.m., she would get up and make coffee for him and then check on her two children. One of these was four-year-old Jeremy Grice whom came from a previous marriage with Father Ray Grass. Donna would peek in to see Jeremy's room and see that the blankets were pulled up like normal. She did not actually see him, but she knew that he always burrowed up under the covers when he slept. So his mother thought nothing of it and went back to sleep. Around 10 a.m., Donna would be awoken by the cries of her baby daughter. After getting up to check on her, she would now go back to check on Jeremy again and possibly wake him up if he was still asleep. But when she looked into his room, it was like nothing had changed from when she looked three hours before. She walked in closer to realize he wasn't there. Soon, she began checking around the house for Jeremy, but could not find one sign of him. She would then place a call to the police to report her missing child, and they responded quickly. A massive air and ground search was carried out, and in particular, was two ponds nearby that stood out to investigators. They wondered if the young child had gotten out of the house and made his way here and accidentally drowned. These ponds would eventually be drained and showed no signs of the young boy. But why did they even suspect he had wandered off? Well, there's actually a weird reason for that. Because Donna's neighbor would come forward and tell police of an odd thing that she had seen that morning. Because according to her, at 8.45 a.m. when Donna was asleep and his stepfather was at work, the neighbor would see Jeremy standing at the mailbox he had his dog and bicycle with him and appeared to be waiting on the school bus. Now, why was this weird? Outside of the obvious, I mean. Well, for one, Jeremy didn't even have school that day. But maybe even more bizarre, the weather that morning was awful, cold and rainy, and almost three inches fell between 4 and 9 a.m. And Jeremy was just standing there barefooted without a jacket in the rain. A truly perplexing scene. And this is the one controversial key clue to this whole investigation. Many question why this neighbor, presumably an adult, would not say anything to a four-year-old standing barefoot without a jacket in the cold in heavily raining conditions. Why didn't she notify the parent or tell the kid to go back in? I guess it's possible she didn't want to be seen as a nosy neighbor. Regardless, it's weird. In fact, Jeremy's mother would later on question this neighbor's version of events, claiming that the dog, who always followed Jeremy, was still in the house when she awoke. She also stated it was odd because he would not just wander outside into severe weather. Similarly, I was able to find one other source that stated police could never substantiate the neighbor's account. Now why they dismissed it, I could not find. But his family has always stated their belief was that Jeremy was abducted by someone from the local neighborhood. Law enforcement have never said that, but did state the theory was that he was abducted by a non-family member. In fact, Detectives looked at serial killer William Downs, who was convicted of killing two young boys in 1991 and 1999. He would even admit guilt and was executed in 2006. The latter one occurred in North Augusta, where Jeremy lived. However, William had just confessed the other two crimes and was always adamant he was not involved in Jeremy's disappearance. And he was probably telling the truth. He would have been 18 at that time, and while not unusual, most serial killers do not start until their late 20s at the earliest. Also was the fact that he was living about three hours away in Albany, Georgia at the time, which is why police have never looked at him as a serious suspect. However, it's been close to four decades and no one has any idea what happened to Jeremy and investigators are not hopeful that we'll ever get a resolution. April 
April 16, 1968, Sonora, Texas, a ranch hand, out doing some work near a barbed wire fence line not far from Highway 27, would come across a gruesome scene that almost certainly he was not prepared for. He at first seen blood at the fence gate, to which he followed a trail of to a nearby big tree. Here he found that of a man who had obviously been murdered, 29-year-old Juan Ariano. And while the murder of one man along a desolate highway may not be the most mysterious unsolved crime we have looked at, this one was a long ways from being over. Because in the rocks and shrub nearby lay his five-year-old son, Manuel Jr., two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Leticia, and one-year-old son, Eduardo. A few more feet from this, in some brush, lie Juan's 19-year-old sister, Rosa. And finally, about a mile south down the road, in a ditch, was Juan's wife, 25-year-old Monica. Of course, this mass killing was huge news, and a ton of resources would be put up to solve it. Detectives would first canvass the scene, and the carnage was terrible. Two-year-old Leticia had been shot twice between the eyes, but amazingly, survived. Manuel Jr. was shot in the head and stabbed, but also remained alive. He would undergo multiple brain surgeries, and would be the lone person to make it out of this terror alive, because Leticia would succumb to her wounds two days later. The other victims had been beat, stabbed, and shot, and Juan's sister, 19-year-old Rosa, had been assaulted as well. It's one of the most heinous crimes in Texas history. Detectives would try to retrace the family's day, and soon found out that early in the morning hours, the family piled into their car to make the nearly four-hour drive from Mexico to San Angelo, Texas, where they were going to visit relatives. Juan was fluent in English and had been a migrant farm worker for years and expected no trouble. But on their journey, on an isolated part of the road, their vehicle would get a flat. Juan would pull to the side of the road to fix it, and before long, the family was back out on the highway. But crazily, just a few more miles down the road, they sprung another flat. Fortunately, or should I say, unfortunately, a good Samaritan showed up to take them 30 miles up the highway to Sonora to get the tire repaired, and then return them to their car. What happened after this has been a mystery for 60 years, and is the oldest unsolved mass murder in the country. Five people murdered, and for what? Robbery? Or a more deviant motive? Well, that brings us to the only known eyewitness we have, because two weeks after the attack, five-year-old Manuel, who miraculously survived, was finally able to talk to investigators. They knew that after taking them to get their tire patched, and then driving them back to their car, that something happened about eight miles away from where their vehicle set, which sparked the massacre, and they hoped Manuel could shine some light on it. But what he would tell them only made it more confusing. According to him, the big cowboy, as Manuel called him, was shooting at deer and rabbits out the window on their way back from Sonora, which greatly upset Juan. Now I have to clarify here, I'm not sure if the cowboy was doing this while driving, which upset Juan because of how dangerous it was to do that while driving, especially with his kids in the truck, or if it was just that Juan didn't want him shooting animals around them, or he just didn't want guns around the kids, or maybe he just had a suspicious feeling about the man. Regardless, Juan would try to stop him from shooting and snatch the gun away. This led to a struggle between Juan and the cowboy, and I assume at this point they were parked, because Manuel would say that his father made a run for it and the cowboy shot him in the back before murdering everyone else. Police would then talk to the attendant working at the repair shop, as well as a few other witnesses, one who passed the truck on the highway. Going by these witnesses and Manuel, they would make a sketch of the man and pass it around. They described him as being a white, tall man in his 30s, with sandy hair, light eyebrows, and pock marks or a rash on his neck. He also wore a straw cowboy hat, eagle design boots, and carried a large hunting knife on his belt. He was large, over 6 feet tall, and weighed about 200 pounds. He was also driving a two-color 1967 Chevy Fleetside pickup truck. Police then brought in several people for interrogation, which led to nothing. And the men questioned would also be viewed by the attendant at the repair shop, as well as the few other witnesses who had seen them. And they all stated this was not the same man that was with the family that day. So police were back to square one. No murder weapon was found. No suspects, 
not even a person of interest. Over a decade later in 1982, the case was definitely cold. Although, detectives had accrued over thousands of pages on the case, it would remain this way for another 17 years when in 1999, the Texas Department of Public Safety would get a mysterious tip. The caller stated he knew the identity of the killer. Detectives, unfortunately, were able to run down and finally dismiss this tip and identify the caller as an unreliable source. But that tip did help in sparking a new investigation. Cold case detectives picked up the files and started again, interviewing old witnesses, even the rancher that had found them. They searched tirelessly for the old vehicle, but could not find it, presuming it had been destroyed in a salvage yard. They would also interview the original lead investigator and have saved his sworn statement just in case someone is eventually arrested and taken to trial for the murders. They would even go to Mexico and link back up with Manuel Jr., but he could not provide much help. They also would DNA test pieces of clothing and other physical evidence in hopes of finding the killer. The case would still not be solved, but cold case detectives did make some progress. They now believed more than one person was involved. They also believed a different motive than the original investigators, because the first detectives believed most likely it was a hate crime, followed by the second most likely motive, sexual assault, and finally, theft. But the new cold case detectives reversed this line of thinking. They now thought he was most likely a robbery gone bad, which led to murder and the sexual assault of one victim. Cold case detectives also believed whoever was responsible most likely repeated the offense somewhere else. This case is largely forgotten about in the area now. And although cold case detectives were optimistic when reopening it back in 1999, it seems cold again, as one of the last updates I could find came from 2006. And that detective claimed that while the investigation was not even in the ballpark in 1998, in 2006, they were on third base and were very confident they were close to cracking it. However, that has not been the case. July 1878, the New York Times will pin an interesting article on a very bizarre paranormal encounter. The town, Parkersburg, West Virginia, the people involved, local farmers. According to a telegram sent from Parkersburg to a major Cincinnati newspaper, at around 7 p.m. this hot summer evening, a farmer, after plowing his field for a while, decided to stop and sat down to take a break. While sitting there resting, he would notice something off in the distance, high in the sky, that seemed to be floating towards him and the other farmers in the area. Perplexed, he stood up and watched the object as it got closer and closer, having no idea what he was looking at. But it would become clear to just what this man was seeing, and he could not believe it. It apparently was a horse, and this horse appeared to be making swimming motions high up in the atmosphere. He was thrashing its head and neck, from side to side while kicking, like it was trying to remain above water, all the while continuing to ascend up into the air. It was at this point, he would yell at the other farmers and tell them to look up, and they did, and they too were just as perplexed. Eventually, the few men would watch as the white horse would float off into the ever-increasing night sky. They would then report the whole strange affair to the local newspaper, and soon, that account was sent to the Cincinnati newspaper where it was then picked up by the New York Times. But what exactly happened here? Was it a hallucination? Probably not, since they all seen the same thing. What about an optical illusion or mirage? This would actually be conceivable, as we have covered the phenomenon before, known as a sun dog, which is an atmospheric optical illusion. And it's possible what these men seen was a bright spot beside the sun that resembled a moving horse. The more fanciful theories state it was some kind of cryptid, or perhaps a horse, being abducted by a UFO. While the more mundane theories are that of a strange cloud, or that the whole thing was a hoax by the Cincinnati newspaper to drive up sales, as that was not uncommon at the time. August 6, 1990, 71-year-old Gladys Stella Kidd of Moorhead, Kentucky, was leaving the farm she had for so long called home to a nearby bank. The retired widow had long been telling her children she could no longer manage the farm and had intended to sell it. Her kids understood this and even took her house hunting, although 
Gladys never seen anything she liked. In fact, she was completely disinterested in the whole process, which was certainly odd, but that was part of the course for the past few months, which had been really strange. For instance, Gladys had already put the farm on the market and sold it before she even told her children. But it's stranger yet, because in the preceding two years, the elderly lady had gotten a boyfriend. And while that's not so odd, the fact is, this boyfriend wanted to keep their relationship a secret. The mysterious person would often call Gladys at the home she shared with other family, and if anyone answered the phone other than her, this person would immediately hang up and then call right back, at which point Gladys would rush to pick up the phone before anyone else could. There, she would rush out to meet this boyfriend at a hidden, undisclosed location, I assume, for a quick lover's rendezvous. Her family would state later that this boyfriend was a factor in the growing distance between Gladys and her family, and obviously, they did not like it. But Gladys refused to give any info about this secret lover, other than to say the family did know him, and they would be surprised on finding out who it was. So as I mentioned, the whole background to this one was odd, but it gets worse, because as we come back to the 6th, as Gladys is leaving her home and going to the bank to collect on her now sold farm, the bank associate would be taken aback to hear Gladys decline a cashier's check and instead insisted on getting cash from the bank. The associate pleaded with Gladys to not take the money, citing the danger, but she insisted and the bank had no choice and handed her over $80,000. The 71-year-old would then gather her clothing and a file cabinet, throw it in her car and leave. Her family was understandably hurt and confused, and even a little worried, and it only got worse when her car was found in town with the keys left inside, meaning someone had picked her up. But 17 days later, Gladys would write them a letter, which was postmarked from Lexington, about an hour away. She had sent them to her two daughters and her son, with the one to her son being a bit mysterious. It read, Don't try to find me. I would just leave. Don't spend money trying. Love, Mom. The kids were now super alarmed. The writing was definitely similar to hers, but Gladys, who only had a fourth grade education, seemingly wrote the letters perfect, and it was not characteristic of her as she struggled with writing and reading. They also found it weird that she would just abandon them, but more importantly, her grandchildren, who she cherished. Furthermore, Gladys had never traveled much, leaving Kentucky only a handful of times in her life. Her family and friends all agreed it wasn't adding up, especially when her social security checks were uncollected and her driver's license was not renewed. Her family would file a missing persons report that led to nowhere and the case went cold. It would take 17 years when in October 2007, law enforcement would take backhoes and dig at an undocumented location in the local area. Apparently, whoever owned the property before would never allow police to dig there, but now since the bank owned it, they allowed it. However, this dig found nothing. Of course, the key thing in all this one is, who was the secret boyfriend? And did something nefarious happen? Or did Gladys and a man run off to live their golden years together? That one was doubtful, because police do suspect foul play. As far as who, well, there's not a lot on this one, but there is a little speculation. For one, Gladys was big into church, leaving some to question, is it possible someone from church was having an affair with her and the two ran off together? The thing against this is, nobody else from the church disappeared, which means someone from her church would have had to pick her up in that parking lot, taken her somewhere else and killed her, and then took her money and continued to go to the same church like nothing ever happened. I mean, it's possible, but that one seems like a stretch. Also, it's worth noting, her church family also knew of her secret boyfriend, and it's a good possibility if an affair was going on at the church, someone would have known who this man was. Others point to a totally different direction altogether. What if Gladys had found a younger man, a much younger man, and the two began a secret relationship to avoid judgment about their age gap, and maybe this young man had more in mind than love or an affair? and carefully planned out the whole thing from the start, from getting her to sell her property, taking cash only, and meeting him at that parking lot, where he then done something to her. Of course, there's no proof of this, unless it's something being kept secret by the police. But if that is the case, this person 
would still be plenty young enough to convict. June 18, 1953, young Houston housewife, Hilda Walker, was sitting on the porch of her home along with her neighbor Judy Meyer, 14, and Howard Phillips, 33. It was a human night and the neighborhood was quiet, but that would not be the case for long because about 25 feet away in Hilda's sight, she would see something she could not explain. Across the lawn was a huge shadow. She at first thought it was the magnified reflection of a big moth flying under a nearby streetlight. But all of a sudden, the shadow jumped up quickly into a pecan tree. This is when the other two, Judy and Howard, would notice as well. This being that jumped into the tree was shaped like a man about six and a half feet tall with huge bat wings on its back that folded at the shoulders. The man, who appeared to be Caucasian, was wearing gray or black skin tight clothes, a black cape, and quarter length boots sort of like Batman, with the strange yellow glow that shined around him. They were stunned and just stared at it for 30 seconds while this individual swayed on a tree branch. Soon, the light began to fade and the being vanished, which caused the young, terrified Judy to let out a scream. Right after, a loud swooshing noise would go over the housetops and across the street, and the three would see a white flash of a tornado-shaped object. They would then see another flash of light rise from another tree and then take off like a jet, leaving a mysterious white flame and smoke that emitted behind the creature before it disappeared over the horizon. Hilda was so scared, she would go to the police the next morning to fill out a report. The account would go down to be known as the Houston Batman and would be the most famous sighting of the cryptid, although there would be similar accounts of flying humanoids across Texas and Mexico in the years that followed as well as one in the 90s when there was an instance of multiple employees at a Houston theater claiming to have witnessed a gigantic helmeted man crouching on the rooftop looking down at them, which some try to connect to the original sighting. Many have compared this to the Mothman sightings, going as far as to call it the Houston Mothman. As far as theories go, some suggest, well, that it was a cryptid, maybe even one link to the Mothman. Some have a more outer space belief, stating that the being was really an alien. And finally, it's just a good possibility that the whole thing was a hoax pulled on Hilda by a man in a suit. If you are watching this video, chances are you've heard the name Edgar Casey, aka the Sleeping Prophet of Kentucky, who would go on to trance-like states and give numerous predictions to several people over his lifetime, and sometimes he would just give general predictions for the world. Depending on who you talk to, the controversial Edgar Casey was either a truly gifted man or nothing more than a fraudulent charlatan. But did you know there was another prophet not far from where Casey lived? In fact, this prophet made one huge prediction that as insane as it was, absolutely came true. John Hendricks was born right after the Civil War on November 9, 1865, in Anderson County, Tennessee. In his 20s, he would marry and become a father, remained in the area, and built a farm at a place called Barra Creek Valley. By 1900, he had four children and life was great, but that year, his two-year-old daughter would pass away from diphtheria, which is a bacteria-caused disease, in a time when antibiotics were still a ways off. The blow was more than John's wife Julia could take. She became angry at John because shortly before the child got sick, John had spanked her for misbehaving. Julie was convinced that this is what caused her sickness. She would resent John forever, taking the other three children, divorcing him, and getting remarried in Arkansas. John was now distraught. He had lost everything in a very quick amount of time. He soon began to look into religion, then found himself dipping into mysticism. He would often go out into the woods to pray, and at one point, he would claim to hear a loud voice telling him to stay in the woods for 40 days and nights, and he did, living in the East Tennessee forest, sleeping on the ground, praying every day for guidance. When he finally completed his 40 days, he would still continue to go into the woods to pray, and he began having visions that he told his neighbors about, and as you can imagine, this left them a little bit worried, and they eventually reported him to local authorities 
who declared him insane. He was then sent to a poor farm, which was a place before social security you could take the poor or homeless residents to that was a farm where they would work in exchange for food and shelter, albeit the rules were very strict and the accommodations weren't much. John did not like this and would eventually escape, and it was here he made his first accurate prediction. He claimed that in a vision, God had shown him the farm was going to burn down within the next month, and a few weeks later, he was struck by lightning and burned down to the ground, just as he predicted. But, as spooky as that is, that is not the prediction that would put him into history books. We have to go back to 1900, when he spent that 40-day period in the woods, where he later told his neighbors about the visions he's seen. The same neighbors that would eventually report him to authorities. But one of these eerily came true. He would tell these neighbors that this little valley they now stood in would one day be filled with buildings and factories that would go towards winning the biggest war mankind would ever see, and that there would be a city on Black Oak Ridge where engines will dig big ditches and thousands of people will be running back and forth every day. Buildings that will lead to a great noise and confusion and the earth will shake. In that part of the country now sits Oak Ridge, one of the sites used in the Manhattan Project during World War II and whose atomic bombs were used in 1945. John would die 15 years after he made this prediction, never seeing that the vision he had had would really come true some 30 years later. So did John really see into the future? Or did he just make enough predictions that one finally stuck? Even if that was the case, it was still pretty good. July 15th, 1984, 28-year-old Donna Ogletree Johnson would leave her home in the rural county of Lamar, Georgia. She had intended just to go to a nearby dumpster where she would throw away some trash. Along with her, she took her two small dogs and did not expect to be gone very long. But like a lot of cases we have covered, Donna would indeed not return. It would be a little bit before her husband Jimmy would become alarmed and began calling other family members and friends to see if anyone had heard from her. When it turned out nobody had, her family and friends would begin a search for her. Within a few hours, Donna's nephew would find her vehicle abandoned at a dumpster with her two small dogs still inside. He would rush back to tell the family, and a phone call was made to the police because they knew this was uncharacteristic of Donna. Lamar County would dispatch Deputy Renee M. Hood, who arrived to the scene at 4.40 p.m., and Renee, well, she knew Donna, as it was a pretty small town, and Donna worked at a local pharmacy, and many people knew her. Deputy Hood immediately knew something was terribly wrong, and would call back to the sheriff's department, knowing there would need to be a search done, and done quickly. And the county, to their credit, responded. A search party was organized in a short amount of time, and they began to drive all over the area, or hike into the woods when needed. They searched all over. Unfortunately, it started to rain, and I'm not talking about a quiet little rainy evening. No, this was a downpour. Actually, it was one of the biggest rainstorms to roll through the area in a long time. It was that bad. But law enforcement persisted, and before long, at 8.52 p.m., Donna was found three to four miles down an abandoned logging road. She was deceased, and more shockingly, she had been bound and gagged and left in the rain-filled muddy vehicle tracks. Unfortunately, the heavy rainfall had washed away much of the potential evidence, and if this was all there was to the case, it would be sad enough on its own. But this one is simply awful, and if you're squeamish, I suggest skipping to the end, because Donna was brutalized, described as the worst murder in Lamar County history, and one of the worst in Georgia history. And it's what sets it apart from other murders. She had been overpowered and hogtied by someone who knew a lot about knots, possibly a former Boy Scout, sailor, or rodeo hand. She was then gagged with her bra and panties and beaten unmercifully, most likely when it was discovered she was on her menstrual period because the perp, or perps, instead of physically assaulting her, they defiled her with a metal rod instead. As bad as this was, she had still survived up to that point, so the degenerate got into a vehicle and ran over her, but Donna still refused to die. That's when the suspect would finally take a small hatchet or some kind of similar tool and would end her life by striking her in the skull. Detectives 
who were horrified, would state this was not a domestic dispute or angry boyfriend or angry husband, nor was it about money or heck, even about sex. This was a thrill killing by a sick individual who wanted to see her suffer. The investigators at the scene, as well as a few journalists who were given access to the crime scene photos, describe it as the worst they have ever witnessed. Despite the heavy rain, her clothes appeared dry, which meant she had only been dumped here. She had severe damage to her shoulder, and the waist of her jeans had been cut off with a knife or scissors, leaving her bare and exposed. Two deep wounds were found in her thigh and bruising on her back, while her hands and feet were bound behind her. The tire tread on her back also matched the one left at the scene. Detectives said it was the handiwork of an extremely violent person or persons, so with that, you would think that this person would have to be captured, right? Well, unfortunately, police had a hard time finding leads. First, they had the bad luck of the crime scene being just absolutely drenched in a freak rainstorm. And when they were not getting anywhere, frustration set in and finger pointing began. The district attorney tasked with prosecuting the would-be suspect would make claims that by the time he got to the scene, people had trampled all over the evidence because police didn't contain it properly. But law enforcement disputed this, stating that once the body was found, an officer blocked off the scene until investigators arrived, which only took a few minutes. And as you might imagine, the community was now on high alert. With the savageness of the attack and police seemingly having no idea where to look would of course lead to rumors and gossip, which led to one of the early theories. Turns out there was a well-known place in town called The Mansion, which was nothing more than a drug house. It was a place that known drug users would hang out and was actually used to move massive amounts of drugs throughout the area, which were allegedly brought up right off the boat in Miami and then brought here to circulate. They dealt in marijuana and meth and moved extremely huge amounts through. And the key that possibly links them is a vehicle. See, going back to that search for Donna, one state trooper, after hours of searching in the miserable conditions, would decide to drive back home. And on his way, he just happened to pass the logging road where she was later found. When he was called later that night and told where Donna's body had been recovered, he immediately remembered seeing a green station wagon sitting in the vicinity of where the body had been found. At the time he seen it, he never thought anything of it, but now, of course, it stuck out to him, and he would tell investigators, which brings us back to this drug house. Customers here, aka police informants, would tell investigators that would often see a green station wagon along with a green truck parked at the drug house that belonged to a local roofing company. They were known to be on meth and stayed strung out, and most importantly, carried around the roofing hatchets on their belt. And if you're thinking that the state trooper that just happened to drive by the trail where Donna was found is suspicious, well that's not the case. Because remember, she was not killed there. In fact, detectives still don't know where she was tortured and murdered. The body was just dumped there, in the middle of a storm. A perfect storm. The car had been wiped clean of prints too, and pulling off something like that in the broad daylight in an alley where a dumpster sat right next to the road, well, that didn't make sense. Instead, whoever parked the car there did it to stage the scene. But the drug house slash roofer's theory never panned out, which just allowed more rumors to grow. Soon, one would come from a man who would claim that Donna was killed by three men in a trailer. Supposedly, when the wife that lived in the trailer returned, she found all the carpet had been removed, and her husband would tell her they had just cleaned a deer in the trailer and had no choice but to get rid of the now stained carpet which was obviously suspicious. That must be what the wife thought too, because she left her husband three days later and moved to Missouri, while one of the men involved in the so-called deer cleaning fled to Alabama even quicker. But this lead was also followed, and it led to nothing. By 2010, investigators done away with the crazy theories, like the drug house, and instead focused on the brutality of the murder. They believed it was the largest piece of evidence they had, and narrowed down the field to only a few suspects. They further stated that a lot of the old leads they had been chasing were put out there by the killer or killers to throw off law enforcement. They would exhume Donna's body but could not pull any DNA, but they still have the rope and believe at some point the technology to get DNA from it could potentially happen. As far as suspects go, 
We only know about one they sort of looked into. This came back in 2005 when the VDOC Society got involved, which is a club made up of some of the best cold case investigators in the country, coming from former FBI profilers, homicide investigators, scientists, psychologists, prosecutors, and coroners. And after two decades, after no movement on the case, they would reach out to the sheriff's department and offer their help. After about a year researching it, they would come back and state they believed they had found the man responsible and recommended an arrest be made. Although, they did admit he was mainly based on a lot of circumstantial evidence. However, Lamar County authorities declined to pursue it, claiming there was nothing there, which was a move that upset some residents as they speculated the local law enforcement did not want outsiders solving the case. 2020 is the last update we would get when new details emerged about a man spotted on the road which connected to the logging road where Donna was found. He had been seen multiple times by multiple people between 3.30 and 4.30 p.m., right before she was reported missing. He was spotted in a maroon vehicle with spoked wheels. As far as theories go, there's not many. The investigation didn't have the best conditions to start with, and it led to gossip, which tainted the investigation. Regardless, the original district attorney did speculate that the murder was committed by a serial killer going through the area, or it was just a random one-off event. Others point closer to home and state that it was someone who knew Donna well. Others still think it was someone from that so-called drug house. nineteen sixty six Gaffney, South Carolina. During a night patrol of police officers C. Hutchings and A. Husky were driving down a murky rural road at around four AM. As they neared a right angle bend, out of the darkness and into the headlights view came a metallic object right in front of them. It was spherical, with a wide flat brim around it. They would stop, and the object did as well, just a few feet from the car. Hutchings estimated the object was about 30 feet in diameter. What happened next would make this one of the most intriguing paranormal mysteries from the South, because a small door on the underside would suddenly open without a sound. Then, a short ladder about five feet long dropped down. White light shined from the inside, which kept the officers from seeing in. A figure then appeared in the doorway and went down the ladder and then slowly walked towards the officers. When it got about 15 feet away, it stopped. The men described it as humanoid in appearance, like that of a 12-year-old boy, about four feet tall. No helmet, no headgear, but he was wearing a gold suit with no buttons or zippers. The costume was shining like metal because of the reflection from the car's headlights. The being then asked numerous questions, like why they were dressed the way they were. But when officers asked this being where he was from, he just laughed. Officer Hutchings would claim he could not see the being's feet, although it could be because it was standing in high grass. Both men reported not remembering the full context of the conversation, but stated the alien spoke perfect English. The whole thing took place within two to three minutes before the being stated, I will return in two days, then turned around, slowly walked back to the ladder and into the object. The ladder was then raised, the door closed, and the craft lifted with a soft whirring sound. It then vanished into the sky. The men went on to report the strange encounter, and a local councilman did go to the site to look and found numerous footprints where the being was said to have stood. This account was then given to John Keel, who was a journalist and ufologist, and of course, the officers, fearing ridicule, never gave full names, and maybe even gave fake last names. There's not much out there about this one. However, he went on to become South Carolina's most famous UFO encounter. As far as theories go, well obviously, the most likely one is someone was having a laugh at John Keel's expense. But maybe, just maybe, it really happened. That does it for the Southern series. I hope you all enjoyed. It's been a fun ride. For now, I say goodbye and goodnight.